Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm talking about influencers and sunscreen, the social media landscape, and the impact from my perspective of the TGA regulations. My specialty is misinformation, about two thirds, so all of this pink stuff of my Instagram content last year was on misinformation and about half of that was on sunscreen. I've worked with sunscreen brands on paid partnerships, I've talked about free samples and I've consulted for a few companies on product development. Let's start with the social media landscape. So for about 20% of Australians, social media is their main news source and this goes up to almost half for 18 to 24 year olds and about a third of them get their news from celebrities or influencers. So it's kind of taken over the cultural position of free to air TV. And on social media, there is a lot of sunscreen content. So this is all just a tiny sampling. There's been a boom in skincare and sunscreen is promoted as the skincare product that everyone needs. A lot of people also haven't found a sunscreen that they like yet. And it is a scientifically complex product. It is hard to formulate a thin film on a moving surface that actually blocks UV. So there is just a lot of confusion. There's also been a lot of scary news stories about sunscreen that go viral. It hooks into a lot of biases and conspiracies. So all of these messages together lead to a lot of confusion for consumers. There's been a massive rise in dangerous sunscreen trends and anti-sunscreen misinformation. And a huge driver of this is TikTok. Misinformation just does really well on their algorithm. And this is worrying because it also has the youngest demographic. There are lots of teenagers who use it as a search engine instead of Google. And again, this is just a tiny sampling of what's up there. Um, we have the general sunscreen is bad for you. The sun is natural, which is good. That sort of messaging. There are people who are making their own safer DIY sunscreens. There's sunscreen contouring, which is using sunscreen to strategically tan slash burn in particular spots. And one trend that is growing rapidly is US doctors telling people to avoid chemical sunscreens, which ironically does happen in this Forbes article. I'll get more into that topic a bit later. Now, most of this is coming from influencers from the US, but even as Australians, we aren't safe because the US has a massive cultural impact with any English speaking stuff online. More than half of the sunscreen content that I come across on social media is from the US. And the main reason is just simply population. We just don't have as many people posting from Australia. But this has been increasingly the case since mid-2022 when the TGA influencer regulations came in. I did a quick survey of five other influencers with relatively large audiences who had talked about sunscreen before 2022. And five out of six of us interpreted the rules pretty similarly. The sixth person admitted that they didn't really understand the rules, which I think is actually a bit of an underrepresented perspective in my sample. And this is also what brands have been telling us. Now, the first two changes didn't really have much of an impact. We were disclosing um, pay partnerships and free samples anyway. This is standard for larger influencers for all products. And we didn't really talk about performance outside of just stating this is SPF 50. So there wasn't really much exaggeration going on. Now, these ones did change how we talked about sunscreens. We now have to post a mandatory statement, like always read the label, etc. And we also have to mention other forms of sun protection and reapplication. We are all mostly fine with these. It is an extra step, but I think we all agree that it is good education for our audiences. But the next two points are a bit trickier. We can't talk about our own experience with the sunscreen. We can't give a testimonial if we've received a free sample or we've done a paid partnership. But we can say that we like it, we can endorse it, we can show ourselves applying it, and we can quote the brand's marketing. And we also have to delete sunscreen testimonials from old content if we receive a free sample later or if we do a paid partnership. And all of us thought that this testimonial points, these are the biggest issues. These regulations make sense for most other therapeutic products. It protects consumers from being swayed by people who have conflicts of interest. And this is a huge problem for things like using supplements instead of cancer treatments. But for sunscreens, is the general public actually being more protected? I'm not sure they are based on my decade-ish of regularly talking about sun protection on social media. So first off, most Australians can benefit from using sunscreen and most Australians don't use enough. And that is not the case for most other therapeutic products. Also, people 
mostly don't want to know about how well a sunscreen works from influencers. They actually want to know about the non-therapeutic, more subjective aspects. I surveyed 2,000-ish people from mine and Hannah English's Instagram audiences. We are probably the two largest sunscreen-ish Australians there, as well as a skincare forum, and about half of the total sample is Australian. People said they mostly trust the packaging for claims about protection and water resistance, as they should, but they trust influencers more when it comes to these less regulated, more subjective things like how the sunscreen feels and looks on skin and whether it stings your eyes. That's because A, these are subjective and different for different people, and more importantly, B, brands often don't describe these accurately. So sunscreens that supposedly have no white cast often look like this on darker skin. I can't tell you how many so-called lightweight sunscreens did not actually feel lightweight on me. This is because these are subjective, there's a range of different opinions on these, it really depends on your skin type, your personal preferences. Now with these regulations, we can only talk about the first three, we, or we can't really talk about them, we can show them visually, so white cast, um, shine and pilling. We can't really discuss the rest of these unless it matches what the brand says, then we can quote them on it. And this is usually a problem when we want to say something negative about a sunscreen that we've gotten a free sample of. And this is interesting because we are limited to repeating the party here that has the biggest conflict of interest, the brand. So this regulation mostly ends up preventing influencers from going against the bias that the regulations are meant to protect consumers against. We can say that a sunscreen is designed to be lightweight, but we can't say something like, this actually wasn't very lightweight for me. There are some workarounds in theory, but they just don't seem to be happening that much. So influencers could buy sunscreens themselves and review them, but a lot of established influencers already had free samples of a lot of sunscreens, so we can't talk about those. People also aren't sure if this rule applies to brand sunscreens if you did a pay pose for the brand's other products. So for example, say you talked about a cleanser. And the biggest headache here is probably this next point. If a brand sends you a free sample later, Brands have influencers' addresses and they send stuff to us all the time without warning. I get about 15 products a week. I do not ask for them and I barely do product reviews. It's just a really good investment for brands to flood influencers with products. It is really cheap for them. Sometimes I actually forget to open samples. They're like sitting at my door for months. The regulations say I should go back and edit testimonials out of all of my old content if I get a free sample and this is just really impractical, sometimes it is straight up impossible. So in general, no one is really buying sunscreens themselves to review except for the influencer who didn't understand the regulations, so this is not really a good sign. Now people could get this information from non-influencer reviews. But people often trust a particular influencer's reviews because they have a track record. These people have gone off and tried that influencer's recommendations before and they've gotten good results. So they think this influencer has similar preferences and opinions to me. If they recommend a sunscreen, then I am likely to enjoy that sunscreen. And this is true. This history isn't there for most non-influencer, more anonymous reviews. And these subjective aspects are significant barriers to people using sunscreen. So 10% of our sample don't wear sunscreen regularly, both for the entire sample as well as the Australians only. And this is pretty surprising because these are people who love skincare enough to fill out the survey in the few days I had it up, to follow one of us or to be participating actively in a skincare forum. So for more than half of this 10%, the reason was texture, then the next highest reason was appearance and eye sting. But about 95% cared about skin damage and felt like they should be wearing sunscreen. And this trend was even more extreme for the Australians. Even more of them think they should be wearing sunscreen, and then more of them are having trouble finding the right one. And this is pretty concerning. I also asked regular wearers about their final barrier to wearing sunscreen and then where they found the information that changed their habits. And this is just the Australians. So for the six standard reasons they could choose from, the most common one was learning about the impacts on skin appearance and then finding a sunscreen with a nice texture. 
They mostly found the sensory information on social media, either an influencer or a health professional. I'm assuming it was an overseas one because in Australia they have even stricter guidelines. They can't even endorse a sunscreen. But really interestingly, more than half of the people got the sunburn and skin cancer message through unofficial social media accounts. So not their own doctors or from an official government source. So influencers clearly have a big role in increasing awareness for a lot of people. And this aligns with the research. So we know that social media is really good for filling in knowledge gaps. People tend to ignore the skin cancer risk if they think that sunscreens are all heavy and greasy. They think that change in their behavior is going to be painful. People might already know about the skin cancer risk, but they don't actually make that behavior change until they find out about the shorter term um, skin appearance benefits. We also know that social media is really good for shifting attitudes. So a messenger who is more similar to you can be more convincing. Seeing a lot of posts like these, which are all about sunscreen, these can be really good for shifting perceived norms. It makes you feel like everyone else is using sunscreen and so you should as well. And these posts also help embed sunscreen into people's routines and turns it into more of a social practice with things like tips and reminders. One really powerful example, I think, was the Today's SPF hashtag. This was started in part by an Australian, my friend Hannah English. This ran from 2019 until 2022, which is when those regulations came in. This encouraged influencers and regular users to post the sunscreen that they were using, and then that would be shared with a larger audience, and that was pretty exciting for a lot of people. And this was really effective in helping people find the sunscreens they liked, as well as reminding people to use it daily. But all of this momentum dropped off massively for Australians after 2022. And here is a quote from an influencer. The trajectory of sunscreen popularity, I think, has come to a bit of a halt with Gen Z. We're witnessing a lack of sunsafe behaviours from them all over the internet. Again, in theory, we could still make a lot of sunscreen content, but in reality, there's just been a lot of disincentives. One influencer was working at a retailer when these changes hit, and because of all the extra rules, they went from mentioning sunscreen about five times a week to maybe once a week. And I had a similar drop in my non-myth sunscreen posts. They've decreased by about that much as well, so it's gone down to one-fifth of what they used to be. And this wasn't intentional on my part. I didn't even realize it had dropped this much until I did this audit for this talk. Some of the extra obstacles, and here are some more quotes from influencers on the right. First off, it's just easier to talk about anything other than an Australian sunscreen. It's hard to make useful, meaningful content about them. None of us really want to just parrot a brand's marketing. We don't make as many posts about them, and then when we do, they get less engagement because less people care about the post, it's less useful. So there's less comments, less engagement, that means the post gets boosted less, it gets seen less. Plus, if we do mention Australian sunscreens, we tend to get awkward questions about the subjective aspects that we just can't really answer. The rules are also just kind of confusing and legal liability is just scary. Brands are also sending out less free samples. They seem to be worried about legal liability. If an influencer does say something wrong, it is pretty hard to monitor. As I mentioned, we do get flooded with samples. It's just easier to talk about something that we already have on hand. We are getting sent everything still, but the Australian sunscreens have dropped off a lot more. So what content is filling the void instead? Well, sunscreen content seems to have gotten a lot less educational, so one influencer described paid posts now as pretty girl content. Free samples also used to come with info sheets, so newer influencers aren't really getting that guidance from sunscreen brands anymore. They are saying a lot of things like, I love this sunscreen because a little goes a long way, and that just does not work for sunscreen. Several influencers told me that sunscreen brands have now switched to launching a lot of um, makeup with SPF. These are secondary sunscreens, so they don't fall under these TGA regulations. That means the brands can still market them using influencer testimonials, which are more convincing, they make more money. There's also less hurdles to launching these products. So it's still great for the brands, but not so good for our skin. Most people don't apply enough of these, but they think they can replace a proper sunscreen. And of course, there's all of the other marketing that just isn't subject to TGA regulations. So things like DIY sunscreen ingredients, tan accelerators, and swimwear as glorifying tan lines. 
There's also international sunscreen content. So one big thing I've been seeing is Australians being encouraged to buy overseas sunscreens, which might not necessarily meet our standards. They also might be exposed to extreme temperatures during transport. On the right here is an example of an interaction I had with an Australian. This sort of thing happens all the time. So they asked me about the finish of an Australian sunscreen. I say, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. They go, why? Um, and then a really helpful international person jumps in with a UK and a Korean sunscreen recommendation. And this has happened so many times, I can't really monitor this sort of thing very well. This is happening to a lot of Australian influencers on a regular basis. So we have a lot more overseas influencers, and this is a bit of an issue because they are generally less knowledgeable about sun protection. They didn't really get our sort of slip soft slap education. A lot of them only really talk about sunscreen. TikTok is also pushing US influencers to talk about sunscreen at the moment because of their direct shopping um, integrations. I follow a lot of US dermatologists and in the last 10 years, I've seen maybe one mention of UV index. The US in general tends to overfocus on sort of more pharmaceutical interventions. Along those lines, there are also sun protective supplements. So a US dermatologist recently launched one. He says he takes it instead of reapplying sunscreen on Huberman's podcast. He didn't disclose that he owns the brand. And Huberman has 6 million followers. And of course, a lot of those are going to be Australians and the TGA can't really do much about that. And most concerning, there is this anti-sunscreen messaging. So obviously there is that growing conspiracy type content. There's also been dangerous trends like the sunburn challenge, which is where people are trying to get as burnt as possible, DIY sunscreen. There's also US doctors telling people to avoid chemical sunscreens based on the FDA absorption studies and the proposed grace status changes. And these trends are only going to get worse. In my opinion, there is a fair bit of urgency to turn the situation around, especially with the increasing politicization of sunscreen and conspiracy groups talking more about it in the context of the US election. The research shows that it gets harder for official bodies to address topics as they get more politicized. I think the easiest thing to do that is pretty low risk is just allow influencers to give testimonials about the non-therapeutic aspects of sunscreen. Right now, these regulations are only affecting the more responsible influencers who know the rules and they were promoting sun smart behavior to begin with. Many smaller influencers don't actually know the rules or they think they won't get caught. I think if you give lots of specific examples to avoid confusion, there is very little risk of harm compared to what we are currently seeing. And most Australians should probably be using more sunscreen. I think we also need to regulate online misinformation more strictly. There's more on this in my other conference talk, but from an Australian standpoint, I think the most urgent is tackling advertising from sunscreen brands who are disparaging approved ingredients. So things like reef safe, endocrine disruption. These examples on the bottom right are from an Australian sunscreen. Apparently the TGA tests reef and ocean safe. That might be news to the TGA. I'm going to leave you with this quote from an influencer. At the start, I thought this was a good idea. I was hoping it would curb misinformation, but so much of it infiltrates from overseas. It is now just annoying not to be able to champion sunscreen properly. Even if I know I don't receive valuable consideration from sunscreen brands, it's kind of stressful worrying that I'll get in trouble for not properly disclosing that I don't have financial benefit. So I end up just not really talking about sunscreen at all. And I think this is pretty much the sentiment across the board. I'll leave it there. Thank you.